uh, you know, the, the, the institution exists in a region of the world that is vastly different than uh, the region in which it was set up. Not geographically, obviously, the geography hasn't changed, uh, but economically, uh, the region is, is, is incredibly different than it was 50 years ago, or even than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you look at a, a region of the world that 50 years ago was a capital deficit region of the world, now it's a, signif it's a significantly capital surplus region of the world. You have you know, huge amounts of liquidity floating around um, Asia um, broadly, and yet you have a huge dearth and need for infrastructure investment. Um, so I think that fact alone, um, you know, abstracting from other mission important objectives such as poverty reduction, um, such as addressing the lack of, of inclusion in the region, uh, such as the tremendous threats of climate change, uh, but just the fact alone that you have uh, tremendous liquidity and yet um, huge problems and challenges with access um, by you know, huge swaths of the population of that region are, are a defining purpose for, for the institution and a reason, I think, why the institution needs to continue uh, to do the work it does. Um, there's also, I think, another, other sets of challenges that exist in the region, which we all, I mean, I don't sit on any panel or, or, or stand in front of any group of people without questions about the AIIB and the New Development Bank. Um, and clearly those are, 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 are new presence in the region that are, are, are not challenges to the institution or its, its raison d'etre, uh, but certainly need to, we have to give thought to what that means for, for us as an institution. Um, so I, I would put out a couple of points, I think, that we need, that we are thinking about in terms of how our institution has to evolve over the course of the next, you know, five years to ten years in order to uh, continue to be relevant in the region and to continue to support the region in its uh, development objectives. I think first, um, you know, we need to be responsive to our clients and our clients are asking for uh, different things than they were asking for 50 years ago, certainly. Uh, but different things that they were asking for even a decade ago. Um, things like local currency financing are not something that we do a lot of, but clearly many of our clientele, as their uh, capital markets develop, as their sophistication develops, they want these kinds of tools much more than they want um, you know, hard currency lending, which is really the bread and butter of our institution. They want more flexible interest, uh, more flexible instruments that recognize um, the increases and changes in capacity um, in these governments, in these markets, um, that, you know, in a sense, many of the instruments or many of the approaches that we traditionally employ don't necessarily recognize that there has been improvements. It's not perfect. I'm not saying in any way that safeguard systems or all of those things in, the, in, the, in these countries are perfect, but they are significantly better and more capacitated than they have been in any time in recent history. And so we need instruments that will help us uh, you know, recognize that. We also need to get far, far better at, um, at the provision of, of knowledge. I mean, one of the reasons in, in, you know, <laughs> institutions such as our own exist is as a, um, uh, you know, a broker of knowledge in the region. That doesn't mean that we need to possess all the knowledge and technical expertise and, and, and uh, um, <laughs> and everything within the four walls of our building, but we need to know where that, it, where that knowledge and experience exists and know how to access it and know how to help our clients understand where that is and help, you know, help, meet, help bring that knowledge to them. We also need to change the speed, the pace, um, and, the, and, the, and the governance of our institution in a way that makes us more responsive <laughs> to the needs of this you know, very, very quickly changing clientele. Um, so that's, I think, how we're looking at the next, you know, five to ten years. Um, and the, I think the implication that that has for the kinds of things that we're going to need to do during that same period of time is, you know, maximizing our, you know, our, both of our financial res resources that we have, but also importantly the leverage that we bring uh, to each individual operation within, within these countries. So to me, you know, uh, any dollar that we invest in a project <coughs> or program in a country really needs to be crowding in other, you know, dollars or pesos or bot or rupee or whatever 
it is in order for in order for it to be you know really truly a transformational kind of investment. And the degree to which we aren't doing that to me is 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 us not fully fulfilling our responsibility in the region. So we need to really I think step up that leverage work. We need to improve the products and the and the methods that we use in 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 doing that. Um, we can talk a little bit about that more. I won't. I'll just touch on that in a moment. We need to strengthen the business processes that we have and streamline the business processes that we have in order that we can again meet the you know the the, the demands of a much more sophisticated clientele. And then lastly, um, you know there is none of this happens without looking at the organization and the institutional arrangements that we have within the ADB uh, in order to assure that those are designed and set up in such a way that we can be responsive. And that goes to looking at staffing skills and making sure that we have appropriate staffing skills and expertise and experience that match what the needs and demands of our clients are. Um, but it also means looking at, the, uh, looking at and ensuring that the organization is set up in such a way that it is able to tap those resources internally, resources externally, and, and bring them to fore in, in bringing better, more impactful projects and programs to our clients across the region. So that's a, you know, a, a little bit of a bunch of different things, but something to start with. Yeah, that's great. I mean, there, there are a lot of elements there to getting toward a better bank, and um, I, I'd like to come back to some of those. Um, but let me shift to, for Marisa Lago. Um, it's striking in the last week, uh, Asia Pivot is in the news a lot again. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the president was off uh, to the G20 and in the region. Nice of him to do advance for this event. That's right. right. <laughs> yeah. it, it gave me a lot to work with, and you'll, you'll hear more from me on this. Uh, but explain this, and particularly the role of the ADB. What, is it, what does it mean for the in administration in, in this broader context of uh, trying to give more attention to the region? So in a development context, why, how do you look at the ADB? What are you looking for, and particularly going forward? I think at the heart of your question is, why is the ADB important to the United States? And the answer is straightforward. It's because Asia, Asia Pacific, is important to the United States. Um, the president was just at the G20 leaders meeting in Hangzhou, China. When the G20 gets together, they talk about strong, sustainable, balanced growth. You can't achieve that globally if you don't achieve it in Asia. It is the most populous region of the world. But it's also the region of the world with the largest number of extreme poor. So if the Asia Development Bank isn't working, you have an impediment to achieving this. Um, at, at a time of an anniversary with a zero, you look forward, but you also look backwards. And so I do think it's important to note that in the first 50 years, the bank can take credit for lifting a billion people out of extreme poverty. That is notable. But the bank's work isn't done. If we look at what the agenda is globally going forward, it aligns with the skills, with the expertise that the bank has, whether it's achieving the sustainable development goals. 50 years ago, we didn't have the SDGs. We weren't even thinking about the millennial development goals. The bank is centrally poised to help us address climate change, whether through adaptation or mitigation, again, a concept that wasn't on the tip of people's tongues 50 years ago, except the most visionary. Uh, strengthening food security. Creating modern, livable cities. 50 years ago, Asia looked very different. I don't think many would have anticipated the size of the megacities that are just the norm in the region today. Um, but also, responding to natural disasters, something that has existed through the years, but that continues. It's a problem that Unfortunately, in 50 years, hasn't been solved. And if one looks forward, natural disasters are um, a fact of mother nature. And so we need the bank to continue to be able not just respond, but to be prepared for natural disasters to engage in more resilient development. Um, to give a sense of the size of the US commitment, thank you for recognizing it, Steve. It is significant. Uh, we are the co-equal largest shareholder with Japan. It is a partnership that we have had with the bank since its founding. And being from Treasury, we tend to like numbers, so I have a couple of numbers. One, as far as the capital that we've subscribed to the bank over the 50 years, 
it is almost $23 billion. And if we look at the Asia Development Fund, which is the fund for the very poorest, which one could say is the heart of the bank, we've given over $4.5 billion in grants. Now, what specifically about the bank makes us so bullish about it? Um, one is infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. It's what the bank knows how to do, but it's not just the infrastructure that the bank finances directly. Steve alluded to the fact of crowding in other financing, making it safe for the private sector, which is obviously essential to growth, to come in and invest. The bank also is able to go beyond the confines of an individual country and focus on regional projects. And regional integration is absolutely essential to the growth of the Asia Pacific region. And then finally, it is um, the fact that the bank looks beyond the infrastructure need and says, well, wait, we have all of this capital in the region. We hear about the infrastructure need. What's missing? And what's missing are the bankable projects, the projects that make sense financially. And so the fact that the Asia Development Bank has set up a project preparation facility which focused on the identified need, maybe not as glamorous as the ribbon cutting for a new bridge, but absolutely essential to get to that point. Um, the other thing that the bank does is it goes where few others dare to tread. And if we look at the activity of the bank in Afghanistan, it is absolutely transformational, both for the infrastructure that has been built, but also because of what it has contributed to the security of the region. One of the biggest supporters of the Asian Development Bank is the US military, recognizing the contribution of the bank. Um, the next is that the bank has been at the forefront of recognizing the need to embrace the Paris Agreement. And President Macau um, is turning the Paris Agreement into a reality. And the diversity of what the bank is doing in this arena is, is striking. It ranges from focusing on urban infrastructure projects to the needs of small island developing states for whom climate change is abs absolutely an existential um, fact of life. Um, the, I had mentioned before the preparedness for natural disasters. We were so heartened by the fact that after the horrific Nepal earthquake, the schools that were standing were those that had been financed by the Asia Development Bank in partnership with the Australian Aid Agency. So not only were the structures safe for the children, but following the earthquake, these became the community centers. These were the buildings that were standing. And so when people talk about safeguards in an abstract sense or view them as a cost, we look at it as the heart of sustainable development. Um, Steve touched upon this, the empowerment of women and girls. I think you mentioned it in terms of inclusion. This is something that the bank does just as a core part of its philosophy, whether it's through financial inclusion, whether it is through supporting the small women-owned business, or whether it's through the last mile infrastructure that connects the women farmers uh, gives them the ability to have a feeder, uh, to have a, a local road that takes them out to the main highway so they can get their products to market. And the final thing that I'll note is financial innovation. Uh, financial engineering, financial innovation can take on a negative cast, but the Asian Development Bank has shown how to do it properly. Uh, the group of 20 leaders around a year ago called on all of the multilateral development banks to look at their balance sheets to see how they could be optimized. And President Macau and the Asian Development Bank were the first ones out of the block by very creatively figuring out how they could combine their ordinary capital with their concessional finance. They were able to markedly increase the resources that are available for the poorest countries um, we estimate that over the years they'll increase by up to 40% and at the same time allow the contributions from the donors to be reduced. That is an absolute win-win and it is the type of creative financial engineering that we're going to need the bank to focus on even more going forward.
That's great. I'm, I'm already starting to panic a little bit because the two of you have teed up so many good issues <laughs> <laughs> that I, I would like to come back to. Um, and I, so I, I'll, I'll not comment on these now except to note that I'm hearing no lack of ambition for the bank on the part of the United States okay. government. Uh, it's, uh, that is striking. Um, so Cheng Young Ri, let me, um, let me suggest that we pretend that you are still chief economist of the bank for a minute. Uh, and if you were advising President Nakao, looking at the economic outlook for the region right now, um, whether in terms of risks that you see um, or from any other perspective, um, how should the bank be positioning itself from that perspective? Uh, going First of forward? all, congratulations for the 50th anniversary for the institution which I have a real love and still you can believe me that I still in my mind uh, part of it I'm still chief economist to ADB. So, uh, so congratulations for the, you know, the anniversary. So let's, uh, to answer your question, let's have uh, some kind of perspective what ADB can, instead of what thinking about what ADB can do, but think about what the member countries actually appreciate in the past and then what uh, member countries are at, at this moment uh, you know, looking for new service from ADB. So it's a more client-oriented basis. I think for Korean, you know, I, when I was very young, I saw many dams and bridges that ADB, you know, helped us to, uh, you know, build. So I know several places that has a plaque that, you know, it has ADB mark. So uh, for me, the first thing that Asian countries really appreciate ADB is that it's you can say persistence, but you, it's a consistent em emphasis on infrastructure in the last 50 years. ADB stands for the many Asians, Asia, Dam and Bridge. And some people say, in a very <laughs> negative tone, say, oh, they are still doing the Dam and Bridge. But for, for many Asians, this is a really great thing because there are several uh, international organizations whose philosophy changes whenever there are some head changes, focus move from one end to the other end. Sometimes you get the funding from some institution to infrastructure funding, but next time you go, they oh, we change the focus and you cannot get it. But consistently, Asian countries can rely on ADB to funding infrastructure. And uh, for many low-income Asian countries, having a, you know, Korea is what would be a good example. Having an infrastructure has a lots of externalities and provide the basis for the, you know, the economic growth. They really appreciate the, the ADB's, uh, you know, the uh, emphasis and contribution to their infrastructure, which I think is important strengths. But Asia, as you mentioned, Asia changed. So together with that, ADB's reputation may be not as high as, uh, you know, compared with my new generation, will have a different feeling. Let's give an example. In a new town, Gangnam area, I don't know whether it still exists, there is a called ADB apartment. When I, when I was uh, young, when I go around the ADB apartment, compared with all other buildings, it was superb. So ADB name is a brand name. It's a really good product. But I think when probably now, if my sons and daughters go around the ADB apartment, I think it's probably it's renovated and no longer exists. But uh, <laughs> if they saw it, compared with the private sector apartment, they will say, what, a, you know, what is this about, right? So in some sense, Asia has changed significantly. There are still, you know, the ADBs, what ADB has to deliver has to be changed. But still, I, mean, I want to emphasize that the infrastructure is still important. The two reasons, one is, uh, one is, but the nature of the infrastructure has to be changed. Now it becomes more soft infrastructure, as you mentioned. You can call it knowledge. But many Asian countries, even developing countries, as now can access the capital market. Money is not uh, you know, an issue. They can go to the, you know, other competing institutions. They have their own savings. It's not money. It's a knowledge. But what kind of knowledge? The knowledge which can make them leapfrog the other countries. You don't want to build the same road. You don't want to build the same dam. You don't want to have uh, some online, you know, the telephone now. You want to leapfrog and how can develop a new system, immediately catch up the you know, advanced economies. For that, if ADB can provide the knowledge, that will be terrific. Because, you know, that makes the many Asian economies leapfrog. That's what they are looking for. Especially uh, if you look at the economic growth prospect, we are worrying about secular stagnation, low growth in the future. So Asia is now growing fast, but they have uh, their own problem, demography, and given the low growth or advanced economies, maybe growth prospect in the future is uh, not as bright. But one good news is that because of the secular stagnation, whatever the low growth and the liquidity of the global economy is very you know, large, interest rate is very low. So if they use this opportunity to finance you know, low interest rate and but very high productivity increasing infrastructure, that can actually contribute their uh, economy to leapfrog many other you know, countries. That's what they are looking for. 
And that, I think, uh, they, they want to have a digital infrastructure. They want to have a knowledge. But more than anything else, they want to have a more efficient government. Yes, you can call this a governance issues. So I, I do not mean necessarily the Western style governance issue that they are looking for. They want to have uh, Asia specific voices and knowledge. Yes, it's easy to say a, uh, ADB has to provide knowledge, but what they are looking for is not the same knowledge that they can get it from the World Bank and other institutions, IMF. What they want to looking for is that, is there something that's specifically adapt, adaptable to the Asian country? So, so far, you know, including the, me and the many academics from ASEAN, we have been contribute to say to the, you know, the you know, international organization, your view is wrong, your views cannot be adapted to Asia. But we haven't contributed to build the knowledge that this is our view, this is a way that we have to do. We didn't provide a constructive you know, input in knowledge, rather than we just satisfied to criticize the Western views and is not fitting to us. And what they are looking for from ADB is to lead this intellectual leadership in how to make a constructive contribution to this even you know, project knowledge, whatever, some constructive Asia-specific knowledge so that the country can benefit from it. I think that's a very important one. So I think if I summarize it, ADB in the past five years maybe uh, you know, stand for the Asia Diamond Bridges, but maybe <laughs> now in the future, maybe this D stand for digital infrastructure, other soft infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Maybe B means for better governance. Not necessarily mean ADB governance itself, but uh, helping for many Asian countries to have a better governance to address the inequality problem, many social problems they have through the infrastructure investment. I think that's a very important point. Thank you, that's great. Um, so Cinnamon, Dornsai, let's mm -hmm. bring in your perspective and um, ask you a little bit to play historian, not all the way back to the beginning of the bank, <laughs> but certainly um, to your time representing the United States on the board. Um, what strikes you as different today um, and what are the new opportunities, new challenges compared to what you were seeing then? Not that long ago, really, but 15 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, thank you, Scott, and um, thank you, everyone. It's always fun to be the last person speaking after so many distinguished speakers. Just to say, I also congratulate ADB on its 50th anniversary. I still have a great fondness and actually still in association with the institution through my mem membership on the ADB Institute Advisory Council, Chang Yang Ri, and I served together there when he was chief economist. So to answer your question, kind of looking back, um, when I first joined the board of the Asian Development Bank, representing the United States as the alternate executive director, people used to call me the alternative executive <laughs> director. I always thought that was kind of fun for those of you that you know, get into this kind of iffy speak. But as I look back, that was 1994 until 2001. And Chantal Wang, who was here, um, took over from me when I left um, to come back to Washington as the acting executive director. And those eight years were remarkable. So I think about ADB really stepping up during the Asian financial crisis and exhibiting a strong sense of leadership. Then President Sato was called upon by the Treasury Department, by the Japanese Ministry of Finance, by other major shareholders to play a leadership role in South Korea. And the largest loan that the bank made during that time that I was there was $4 billion to South Korea, mm -hmm. which had not borrowed from the bank in 13 years, but which conveniently had not graduated. So I look back and I think about the institution responding to what were the needs of the region. They really stepped up. And although structural adjustment was not necessarily a strong point, this is the Asian Development Bank, um, that was more the role of the IMF, to provide balance of payment support, the bank really stepped up. So I would say ADB has played a leadership role in the region. So that's one of the things that I feel most proud about. So I teach a class on the international financial institutions. And one of the things that I talk about is leadership matters. And when you've got a crisis, currently a crisis in uh, climate change, and the ADB is, as Marisa Lago has pointed out, done a really good job. In her opinion, I would agree with her that the ADB has shown leadership in stepping up to some of the current challenges facing our world's economy and the world itself, climate change. So I would say their innovations um, in responding to country-led development and country-specific ideas is very much a part of who they are and where they have been and where I think they will be in the future. Um, you also asked about um, the other thing that has come about is thinking about how the bank can share knowledge. 
And Cheng Young and I, as I mentioned, served together on the ADB Institute's advisory council. The ADB Institute, the internal think tank for the ADB, generates policy relevant research. And so this is increasingly in response, in collaboration with the ADB itself. So it's operations driven, driven by country priorities, but that, and then there's a policy dialogue that is held with high ranking officials from the borrowing countries that will come together and give feedback to the Institute about the recommendations that are made in a range of areas. So it's leadership is really quite primary. It's innovation is quite primary. It's relevance to the region. So when we think about the infrastructure needs, I was looking, you know, there's all these figures that are thrown around, a $8 trillion financing gap in infrastructure around the world. KFW says that the infrastructure gap in Asia is $600, million, $600 billion a year. So the ADB really is called upon to get back to its roots. It's really experienced, it's 50 years old. It's time to really revisit their role in infrastructure is what I would say. Um, the needs are so great and there's co-financing opportunities with these new players. Um, I did some research on the BRICS New Development Bank before coming here today and basically they started their lending back in April but they're lending to themselves. Um, basically in the field of uh, clean energy finance. Whereas the AIIB, what's interesting to me is that all the majority of the four projects that they started out with, that they just announced very recently, are all co-financing with the World Bank um, in Indonesia, looking at slum improvement with a couple of roads projects, um, with the World Bank and with the EBRD, and then the one that they're doing on their own for Bangladesh is in clean energy. I would say that would be an obvious area for the ADB to exercise its co-financing operations to really respond to the needs of the region. And the other is that as the experienced partner, and this is one of the things that I would say I observe from the time when I first stepped in the door um, to represent the US on the board in early 1994 until my position now as a faculty member at SAIS and this ADB Institute membership, is that they are absolutely relevant to the needs of the region. Um, with these very uh, interesting opportunities. They also set the standards in terms of, of upholding environmental and social standards that will define all operations. So all co-financing, whether it's with one of the new players, the BRICS New Development Bank, the AIIB, um, Citigroup, Save the Children, whomever, those ADB standards, um, environmental and social standards prevail um, in terms of determining the scope of the operations and indeed their impact. So to summarize, I would say again, leadership, innovation, knowledge that's relevant to the region, and that the needs are so vast um, that 50 years is definitely not enough, um, and may they have many more. So um, Cinnamon, you, you emphasize the climate agenda. Marisa, I wanna come back to you on this, because this, again, uh, what we saw in the news uh, was, uh, uh, President Obama and President Xi making the formal commitments uh, to the Paris uh, climate commitments. Um, and you know, a big part of that agenda, which I know you are expert on, is, is mm -hmm. climate finance, the, the, the financing aspect of it. So can you go a little deeper on um, when you look to the ADB in particular, and thinking in particular that it's striking that you know, these are the two big players, the United States and China, in terms of where we need to see results. Um, how do you look at the ADB as a financing mechanism? How, how is this operationalized? I do think one of the high watermarks in the relationship between the US and China is in this area of climate change. There was a recognition on both sides that as the world's two powers, we need to grapple with this. And um, the announcements cover a whole range. One, signing on to the Paris Agreement, very symbolic. Um, but also, we were the first two countries to undertake a voluntary peer review of our fossil fuel subsidy reform. Um, China and the U.S. is the first two who stood up and agreed to make the results publish, public. Now, we all know that different countries have fossil fuel subsidies. It's not something you generally like to put out there, but the fact that China and the U.S. were being willing to be transparent. What I find interesting turning specifically to climate finance is that if one looks at the ADB, over 25% of its shareholding is in countries 
that are either middle income or upper, upper middle income. Mm -hmm. And that poses an interesting question as to what is the role of, these, of the bank in these relatively wealthier countries. I don't think anyone questions the role of the bank in the world's poorest countries. But as countries follow the trajectory of Korea, one can ask, how does the bank stay relevant? And as a donor, one can ask, why is this a good use of our taxpayer funds to be investing in these relatively wealthier countries? Mm -hmm. And I do think that global challenges, global public goods like addressing climate change are an area where I think one can find a very relevant role for the bank. Uh, climate change doesn't respect boundaries. Um, I would actually go further and say there are other areas like pandemic response, mm -hmm. like dealing with refugee crises, where the, the bank becomes relevant even in those wealthier countries that are approaching graduation. And so it is heartening to see that we in China share this vision of wanting to see the bank engaged in whether it's renewable energy, whether it is dealing with the effects of pollution. One other facet of it is that we've been talking about the bank, but we should also be talking about the bank as a bridge to the private sector, um, where the bank is the, the seed financing, whether, where it provides a guarantee, where it takes an element of risk out of a project that allows the private sector to come in. And I certainly, looking out over the next, maybe not all of 50 years, but the five or 10 years, see a role for the bank in creating a, a market for more private sector climate finance. And that's where I see initiatives like our partnership with, with China on this, creating the market for um, a transition to the private sector. As you had noted, the key to Korea's growth was started by the bank but it, it accelerates and it takes hold when the private sector sees the opportunities. Mm -hmm. So and I, I'm, I'm going to go to Steve because I want to pick up on something. I'm, and you went somewhere. I'm glad you went because I, I wanted to raise it anyway. It's to recognize uh, the, the different categories of countries. And, and the, frankly, there's a tension here. Um, it struck me, Steve, as I was preparing, I, I noted that the, the, the bank for the first time uh, has um, done a policy loan with China in this area of, of climate relevant work. Um, it's the first time. It's very striking. So tell us more about that. What you know? Why that uh, instrument? Um, and you know, in the context of the climate agenda, what we're looking for from China? What's that about? What are you trying to achieve? What are the tensions? Um, well, specifically on that uh, on that loan, that is the uh, Beijing Tianjin Hebei um, Pollution Control Initiative. It, that's not the exact title, but that's more or less what it's doing. And it's looking. It, we're we're you know, it's a massive program that's financed mostly, obviously, by the government of, of China, uh, but it's bringing in both us and the World Bank, um, essentially helping finance some of the, uh, the the policy changes that are necessary in order to achieve. You know, the the the, the it, it ultimately looking to get cleaner air in that area because we all know about the the massive you know uh, pollution challenges that exist in that general area. And so, what it is essentially is the recognition that um, you know China is 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 a country that that has you know significant resources, can hire experts from around around the world to help them address any number of different challenges they may face. And yet, our institutions are unique in, in how we can bring that knowledge and that information to bear to help you know, solve a problem. And we don't do it, we don't bring an agenda when, when we come beyond you know, trying to solve a problem. So mm -hmm. we're not, you're not hiring us, and we're not trying to create more work for ourselves at the end of the day, and not, not to you know, cast dispersions on, 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 on consulting firms or anything like that, but our, our agenda is to help you, know, you as a as a as a as a government, you as a country, you know, address some of the major challenges that you that you find, and then we can bring in resources and experience and expertise from a wide range of areas to help address that problem. Um, so that's essentially, and we've not done program. I mean, and and up until this first program loan, which was approved by our board, 
um, last year, we had not done this type of lending in China in the past because they viewed you know, any policy um, discussions or, 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 or you know, development as the sole responsibility of, of the government and, and weren't necessarily that interested or, or, or um, you know, per perhaps somewhat nervous about bringing others to the table to have those discussions. And so I think this marks a real mm -hmm. you know, change in orientation on the part of, of China in recognizing that be this pollution or be it climate or be it other areas, these are, these are problems that, that go far beyond the capacities of any individual country to address. And so that they can, that they appreciate the advice and guidance and experience from a wide variety of countries and that that can be brought by us and the World Bank. So that's really what we're, what we're doing in that in that case. But to the larger question of, you know, by 2020, all but two countries in Asia and the Pacific will be middle income. Many of those will be upper middle income. Um, so I think it is a completely relevant and valid question as well, what is the purpose of, of, of this institution whose, you know, original mandate was, was, you know, building infrastructure, you know, then that, that evolved and morphed over time to addressing poverty. Um, which is a completely, you know, valid objective of the institution. But in a, in, a, in, a, in a region now where poverty remains endemic in certain areas, but poverty itself is not the biggest challenge that the region faces. Climate is a clear and huge challenge that the, that the, that the region changes, uh, faces. You know, to the, and this I think goes to Marissa's points very well about what, are the, what is the role that institutions such as ADB can pr pr provide in addressing global public goods or regional public goods. And I would add to that list that, I, that, that, that Marissa put on the table, which I think is a, is a very good list, you know, I inequality and the challenges mm -hmm. of social um, exclusion, which lead to, to, to um, you know, social instability, which leads to, you know, all sorts of other, which leads to migration and refugee crises, which leads to all sorts of other things. So these two are global or regional public goods that, I think institutions such as the ADB can play a role in helping countries think through design programs and projects to help address. And I think that that's a line of business, if you will, for lack of a better term, that is going to go on for quite some time. I wish it weren't, but it, it certainly is. And Scott, if I could just make an observation. I think mm -hmm. Cinnamon, it was, or um, it may have been Chang Young, talked about the fact that um, Korea hadn't borrowed for years, and mm -hmm. yet the global financial crisis came, it was a wallop. Um, I think in order to make graduation not be a dirty word, to have it be viewed as a success, the message has to come out that it's not a one-way street. The banks mm -hmm. are there to help countries in need. Mm -hmm. We see many countries in the region that have not borrowed for a number of years. They're still repaying long tenor loans. Mm -hmm. um, and that is absolutely quite all right. We see mm -hmm. some of them returning if they have idiosyncratic problems, and the bank needs to be that open door to address regional mm -hmm. poverty needs, inequality needs, global public good needs. So let me stick, because you, you had earlier mentioned um, issues of pandemics mm -hmm. and crises of, of very different yeah. natures, but crises. And so maybe to Chang Yong, um, sitting at the IMF now, uh, where this is, in a sense, this is your brand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what is the role, I mean, we'll, we're, we're focused on the ADB, this is about the multilateral de development banks more generally, but um, when it comes to fragility in countries and regions and, and economic shocks, whether caused, it could be caused by a natural disaster or something else, um, there's, there's been this you know, very long-standing debate over uh, proper lanes and the, the role of the IMF. And, um, mm -hmm. is, how much of a real issue is that in, in the region, and how would you define a role for the ADB when it comes to helping countries respond to crisis? So you're not asking me to answer as a ch chief economist or the director of the IMF? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. You probably should answer in your current job. Yeah. No, I'm just, yeah, just kidding. But I think at this moment, if you look at the ADB's goal as a budget support the crisis uh, financing mechanism, you may say why this is a new area, but at the same time, if you look at the recent fund effort, we are providing lots of the budget support for the countries which are natural disasters and climate change related financing tools, something like that. So I think uh, 
it will be very difficult to say the well, you know, these issues are really complex. For example, if you talk about climate change, fund is now uh, you know, helping China very much in, in the area of taxation on those uh, emissions and the uh, knowledge is, and we focus on part of the, you know, not funding, but the part of the climate change issues from the fund. And previously, uh, people will criticize why you're doing something, you know, this kind of things. You just focus on the crisis. But, you know, is that the role that you want to? You want to really improve the whole, you know, the global world and to address this important issue? Each institutions can find the area that they can actually contribute. So in my opinion, likewise, when we have, a, a, let's, say, let's make an example, Pacific Island countries, they have a natural disaster. Our economic theory uh, you know, shows that when, you, when the Pacific Island has a you know, relatively good growth rate, their average growth rate is a, as good as other middle income or low income part, you know, patterns. But problem is that when they have a natural disaster, they basically all the gain they had the last couple of years will just disappear. And then the debt problem comes again. So for us, I think a natural disaster is a macro problem. Because if we do not incorporate natural disaster into our debt sustainability analysis and macro financing need, mm -hmm. it will be wrong. So I think natural, understanding natural disaster, how frequent it will be, and when the natural disaster comes in, how we can cooperate with the ADB, World Bank, and others, that becomes much more important. So for this issue, I'm pretty sure that the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the you mentioned global public good, the issue is changing. And the collaboration between the developing agencies and the, uh, the institutions like us should be more tight. And then we can do the division of labor ourselves rather than saying that, okay, this is a development area, you should come, and this is a macro area, you shouldn't come. Okay. So, for example, when you have uh, several Asian countries asking for us uh, our program, I called ADB and whether they're going to you know, coordinate because. Uh, another, let's make another example. When the fund has a program uh, in the 20 years ago before the Asia financial crisis, mm -hmm. you know, you said that the tight fiscal policy, tight monetary policy is a solution. And then I'm, I have to probably admit that at that time the fund must not seriously consider about its impact on the poverty and other social issues. But now if you look at the, uh, you know, the fund program, from the beginning we think about how, what, what is the implication of this fiscal consolidation on the poverty, mm -hmm. inequalities, and the, some of the, you know, the disadvantaged groups. Then we invite World Bank and the ADB to coming in. Can you actually uh, design the program together with us, provide uh, some body support for the poor? And that is, I think, a very desirable change after the Asia financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way to uh, you know, go forward. And just to, just to supplement, I, you know, I think it's, and it's also not, when we think about crises, we can't think about just crisis response. We need to think about crisis resilience, mm -hmm. right, or resilience to crises. And, you know, and that, that crosses the, the gamut from, you know, economic shocks to climate-related shocks and natural disaster shocks. So the role of our institutions is, yes, there is an important response role that, that you have, but also building resilience, developing tools mm -hmm. that allow uh, for countries to, to anticipate and respond to these types of crises um, in ways that don't necessarily require you know, huge budget outlays on the part of our institutions when that crisis comes. And so they, you, know, you use the example of the Pacific, Chung Yong, and to add to that, I mean, there are tools that, that are being developed by us in the World Bank on you know, catastrophe bonds, on, on contingent credit facilities mm -hmm. that are all designed with the understanding that these types of crises are going to happen. And so it's not just a question of waiting for the crisis to happen and then all running around and figuring out what to do. It's you know, designing tools that are able to assist those countries when the crisis happens, because we know it will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me shift course. Um, so I was not the one to invoke, but uh, the, the AIIB, the New Development Bank, mm -hmm. but I, I could guarantee that they were going to come up in this, <laughs> this discussion. Yeah. So let me run with it. Okay. Um, and I have to say, you know, I stand guilty of being among those who exploit the celebrity of these, these institutions and, the, and what was some drama around them uh, a while back. But let's, um, I, I want to situate the question of these specific institutions in a broader context, mm -hmm. which is really about whether or not ADB is, is in an increasingly crowded field in a couple of respects. And I, so I kind of, I guess I would ask it on two sides of things. There's, there's the financing question. This is a region that has a lot of capital flowing mm -hmm. within it. Um, 
And here, actually, these new institutions aren't really relevant to the conversation yet. As you said, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're newly They've financing started. and they're co-financing. Um, to me, the, the uh, a more pressing question, frankly, are the bilateral programs of China, the development banks, the mm -hmm. China Development Bank, Exim Bank. And I am curious how that looks on the ground for ADB, uh, what it's like um, with those actors um, so dominant in the region. There's the financing side, but then there's the side that, Steve, you alluded to, um, is what I would essentially call the bank's ability to persuade when it comes to policy. How do you convince governments to do certain things uh, around certain objectives? Um, and there, I think it is a meaningful question around a crowded field. To the degree that there are many policy voices in play or that countries have the choice to ignore, um, maybe the ADB or others, how does all of that look today? It, it just strikes me that it probably is a more complex picture today than it was 50 years ago. So I'll throw that out to all of you um, to try to answer. Um, well, I'll take a quick stab at it um, first. I think you're absolutely right. It is a much more noisy picture today than it was you know, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, and there are many, many more players out there, um, either you know, multilateral or, or bilateral. And you know, I think that the, what sets you know, us apart, and this applies to the World Bank equally, and I used the word sort of neutral honest broker before, is that we, we are that. I mean, we do have an agenda in the sense that we you know, are interested in good governance, we're, we, you know, we maintain a position towards you know, anti-corruption, all these other things. So there is an agenda, obviously, that comes with it. But it's not influenced by any one country's uh, set of priorities or perspectives. It's an amalgamation of all of our memberships, uh, you know, priorities and, 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 and perspectives. And so that means that, you know, that, they, that the countries will trust that the advice that we're giving, they may not accept it, and they may have alternatives or different choices, and that does happen, and that's, you know, it's a sovereign nation. They have every right to make their own decisions. But they do know that the advice that we are providing is, is not, you know, trying to push them in a, in a specific direction that's beneficial to one country or one set of countries over, over another. Um, you know, so I think that's one thing that sets, you know, our institutions apart from, from their engagement with any other number mm -hmm. of actors that are, that are out there. And it is something that I think that will, you know, continue to be, a, you know, of value to these countries in, in the future. And I don't mean in any way to say that ultimately um, other multilateral institutions that emerge, be that AIIB or the NDB, won't get there as well or have that kind of perspective. But these are also institutions that have said publicly that our focus is on projects. We're not going to be engaged in, the, in, the, in policy debates and policy discussions. Again, that could evolve, but that's what they, they've said, that that's not their, their specific objective. Um, with respect to you know, what the, it looks like on the ground with you know, bilateral Chinese investment, um, you know, there are you know, cases where, where we have developed a project that has ultimately been financed by, by, by China. Um, there are many of different examples, though, where that's happened not just with China, but with other bilateral donors. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not unique to China. And my perspective on that is that, yes, while we do need to continue to be making investments in these projects and continue to give loans in order to keep the cycle moving and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the credit and, the, and, and, and funds flowing and, and, and reflowing back in the institution that allows us to keep doing it again, to me, as a, as a development person at heart, you know, I'm more concerned that that project is, is done and is done in a way that's going to have impact on the people for whom it's intended to have impact. And, and at the end of the day, you know, I, I have a responsibility for making sure that we're doing as much work as we possibly can in ADB. At, at one level, you know, I don't care who's financing it. You know, I want that to get done. I want to get it done with appropriate safeguards and with appropriate consideration of, of you know, indigenous communities and environmental impacts and, and all those other things. But if we design a project that has all of those features and it is financed by someone else and they get a better deal and the country, the finance minister gets a better deal on that, then well, more power to the, the finance minister. That is something we may face in the future, not just in dealing with bilateral donors, but in dealing with the new institutions that are you know, emerging now. And so to me, I mean, I think it was Cinnamon that said that, you know, that, that competition is, is good. And it, it's true. I mean, I think that we, we're not an institution that is complacent 
but we have a certain way that we do our work and a certain way we do business. And when you're a, a you know, when you have a monopoly or an oligopoly, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's not a lot of incentive to change the way you think about or change the way you approach these 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 kinds of projects or programs. And I think that the advent of these new institutions in the long run is only good for the region because it's going to give more options. It's going to create more more finance for the region, but it's also going to make force our institutions to be better at what we do. And if we can't do that, then well, you know, maybe 50 years is enough. I'm confident that 50 mm -hmm. years isn't enough, and that we can adapt to that world. But I think that this these new institutions really, at, at the end of the day, make us all better at our jobs. If I could build on that, um, to us, the key with the new institutions is seeing that they are first properly that they come in with the appropriate approach to development. Uh, we were very heartened by the fact that the AIIB rated the best and the brightest from the Asia Development Bank okay. and the World Bank in mm -hmm. getting themselves set up. And that was something that we celebrated. If you look at their procurement policies, fiduciary policies, environmental and social safeguard policies, they look remarkably like Charter. the constituent documents of the Asia Development Bank and the World Bank. The co-financing is something to be celebrated because there is just that much more money available for these good projects. I also think that with respect to China as the major funder of both of these institutions, that it is almost inevitable that this will affect their approach to bilateral. To me, it is a very, very positive sign that they are so interested in operating multilaterally in with a new mindset. They're not a clone of the Asia Development Bank, but with recognition of the value of the safeguards. I think there is um, another remaining value in the Asia Development Bank that Steve didn't touch upon, which is the message that it sends to the private sector when the Asia Development Bank is involved in a project. Um, there is a stamp of approval, a sense that the project is going to be of a high quality, that it becomes safer for private equity to follow the Asia Development Bank. And I think that you still retain quite a premium, that, that rep intangible reputational premium. I was just going to say, you know, um, if you'll indulge me, I made a, a scorecard. Um, looking back at a year ago, what was it that we were all so worried about, about the AIIB? And some of these things have been mentioned already. So um, you asked, are they going to crowd out? Um, are they going to crowd out existing institutions? Will the ADB be operating in a crowded field? And I would say certainly not, because the needs of the region are so vast. Steve has mentioned and repeated what I said earlier, competition, healthy competition is a good thing. They were going to steal staff. You know, Marisa said, you know, um, they've taken some of the best and brightest from the World Bank, the ADB. Absolutely, uh, this is a good sign. Um, they did so, I think, in a professional way. They really picked what their needs were. The staff of the AIIB can come from any of the member governments of the uh, World Bank, IDA, or the ADB. And you don't actually have to be a member of the AIIB. Those are the criteria. So they s steal staff. Yeah, but isn't that good? They cut corners on environmental and social standards. We were all worried about that. I think we've talked a lot about that this afternoon. I think all of us have concluded cautiously optimistic that because of the uh, standards of the existing institutions governing the co-finance deals that have come forward so far, and indeed in the future, that we're still watching. But the Bank Information Center, this is interesting to me, the eyes of the world are on the AIIB. There's a new campaign on the AIIB that's been started by the Bank Information Center, one of the leading advocacy organizations that takes a look at these institutions and holds their feet to the fire. That's kind of interesting. Um, they would not play well with others. Well, I think we've all talked about that. We were worried about that, but the co-financing leads me to believe that, in fact, they really are wanting to uphold the best standards. They're worried about a not enough good deals. And I'd say this really, I think, Marisa, you said this is one of the challenges. I would agree with that, that as we look around the region, these kind of, we call it low-hanging fruit, a lot of the projects that were co-financed by AIIB were, in fact, already in the pipeline or are second or third or fourth or fifth phases of existing infrastructure projects. So it's really, and then let's see what else. Uh, they would not get a large membership. Well, that's been shown to be not true. 
Um, they have 57 members and growing. Um, and governance, including this non-resident board. I was intrigued to see that these boards of directors that are non-resident are meeting on the sidelines of the World Bank IMF annual meetings. And so I'm sort of thinking, well, you know, that's kind of efficient. You know, so what's so scary about that so far? Um, I'd say the thing that really, that the big question for me is actual governance of the institution. So I looked back at, of course, China is the third lar largest shareholder at the ADB, 6.5%. At the AIIB, they've got close to a third, they're 26%. And there's this thing called a supermajority that they can really block things. Surprise, it's 25% that's needed. China's got 26%. So let's really watch the governance of the institution. And that, to me, is where the ADB can really, I think, lead, again, going back to my earlier point about leadership, this would be a challenge to the ADB to continue to lead in governance as it's led in innovations and in being responsive, um, indeed responding to all the challenges of the region. I, I am have not much things to add, but uh, from an Asian perspective, uh, AIAB, in terms of the funding issues, uh, I think uh, we have to welcome because this is a sign that uh, many Asian countries have bec uh, become a donor too. We mm -hmm. have really received lots of aid from Western that really helped Asia very much. So if you become a middle-income and high-income countries, we really have to pay back and then you know, contribute to the you know, world. So I think it's good to have uh, many Asian countries now want to become a donor, and this is one example. Uh, and previously, this is related with the governance issue. Even though you want to give more money in the existing institutions, you know, without having an you know, increasing quota, whether you have to do it or not, that becomes a quite domestic issue. So still this issue is there, mm. but it's still good to see that uh, many Asian countries, especially China, want to be a donor. And that, I think, is uh, something that we have to welcome and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from Asian's point of view. Good point. And, uh, but, but as for the issue of the you know, co-financing, I, I can fully understand, I agree with that. This is a good approach and really uh, reduce the initial worry that maybe AIB play down the you know, international standard. So I think this is a good strategy to reduce that kind of you know, the worries. But, on the other hand, I think uh, for many Asians, I think it's still true there are some constituent, constituency of the Asian countries which has complained uh, this so-called <coughs> global standard in doing infrastructure investment, governance, and the other safety net. For them, if the AIB uh, you know, really part, part in the joint comp finance and then you know, improve uh, some of the existing rules, they will say this is they really contributed. But if they just stick to the you know the current uh, you know the rules and they do the same thing as World Bank and uh, you know ADB, then in the in the down the road they may be, some constituency may challenge their view that well, you want to do something new but you don't do something. So you really have to see whether the first question is whether the current global standard is really ideal standard, whether there is a room for improvement, and then whether the AIB's emergency can actually make the ADB and the AIB and others to compete to improve the, this uh, you know, global standard, including the governance structure. Mm -hmm. Even they, all, they, all, they have their own problem governance structure, by, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So mm -hmm. let's see whether the, this new uh, you know, institution can actually improve the global standard. That's what actually many Asians are looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want to turn to all of you now. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, there will be microphones that come to you uh, I will call on you. Please identify yourself before you ask your question. So we'll start right here. And why don't we, we'll collect three at a time. Yang No Yoon, uh, Foundation for Empowerment. Thank you very much for a really uh, interesting and uh, it, uh, interesting uh, discussion, which convinces me that yeah, 50 years is not enough and uh, uh, there should be another 50 years, hopefully not. But the, um, my question is that uh, we are very aware that World Bank has a presidency problem, not, not problem, the new president or existing president will be confirmed. I'm gonna ask one question about the presidency of the ADB. ADB should excel in competition with the World Bank and AIIB in terms of governance. Um, ADB has had a Japanese president for last 50 years. In actual context of ADB, it was not even gentleman's agreement. First of all, 
the headquarters is supposed to be in Tokyo, but the Philippines, then President Marcos, really revolted against that. That's, I, yeah, sorry. So that's why too. actually the uh, headquarter was had to be chosen in Philippines. But the president will be actually taking turns. But uh, Japan has talked to the presidency for 50 years. I, we have heard that the uh, ADB has uh, excellent leadership, but whether it's going to um, continue that way or ADB will excel in changing the rule to uh, have the select the president in a different way. Thank you very much. Okay, so should there be a change in the process of leadership selection at the ADB? Uh, we'll go right here. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Albert Keitel with the Atlantic Council. I um, formerly was uh, managing the uh, Office of East Asian Nations in the Treasury Department. I want to <coughs> talk, uh, ask a question about what you think in terms of new ideas or new ways of approaching the problems of mobilizing resources for infrastructure and closing the infrastructure gap mm -hmm. as really a key component for reducing poverty. And I think the, the, the moniker of middle-income country is misleading to say that since you become a middle-income country, poverty is no longer a problem. Uh, it has to do with the definition of, of that, which has, is sort of different from what normal thinking would make it. But the, the big success in poverty reduction and the reason that you can celebrate it is because of China's performance. And so what do you think we can learn from China? It's an Asian experience and it's an Asian performance uh, that has really in many ways broken the rules uh, that were supposed to be followed in the 90s and the 2000s. What, what, could you, what do you recommend as a panel that the ADB adopt or learn, whether it's uh, investment platform companies that are off budget or whether it's uh, development banks that then are backstopped by a non-independent uh, central bank. Uh, what, what kinds of things do you think that you might be able to somehow adapt in your information and your policy recommendations that can really learn from the big success story in your region? Okay, and let's do one more over here. We'll go right up front, please. The woman on the end. I'm Elaine Zuckerman of Gender Action. So I'm going to bring the gender question with me to Great. our panel. Um, I think Marisa knows that I've been going after the World Bank to have a do no harm gender safeguard. We haven't succeeded. Um, the last time we did a scorecard of the gender policies of the different IFIs, the ADB ranked, I'd say, middle to the high end. It wasn't the best in terms of its gender policy. I was wondering if the panelists working or having worked in the ADB could update me and let me know whether, one, the gender policy of the ADB is mandatory as opposed to voluntary, as has, has been the World Bank's, well, is its current gender policy. Um, secondly, does it apply to all operations, including policy-based loans. For example, the IDBs does, the World Banks doesn't. What about the ADB? Um, and thirdly, does it have, or does the ADB have, a do-no-harm gender policy, a safeguard policy? Do the environmental and social safeguards, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, Cinnamon, okay. um, do they include a do no harm gender safeguard? Okay. Those are my questions. So, Thanks. Uh, and I'm glad the gender issue is raised. It's on my list. And for me, there's a, there's a, particularly from a layman's perspective, layman, <laughs> the, there's almost an intuitive issue here that uh, that's hard to understand. You know, this is largely an infrastructure bank. What does it mean to have a gender agenda? So maybe somebody can help us with that. What does it look like in practice uh, when we talk about? Uh, gender issues. Uh, we have the question of the China model and what the ADB can be adopting and learning, and then uh, the question of leadership selection at the bank, which I'm sure everyone is eager to <laughs> take okay. on. But I, th I throw them out all to any of you. Um, I'll, 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 I'll jump in first. Um, I, I, I don't have much to say, frankly, about the first question, uh, other than um, you know I think all of the um, MDBs face this this 
this challenge about about selection of leaders and 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 the, the identification of, of of the president particularly, and I think that there has been a number of models that have evolved um, over the course of the last years that are interesting, um, and I think that there's ways that we can all improve these processes over time, and I think it's just a question. It is a question of time, and I think that we will all ultimately uh, be able to make progress on 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 those on those selection processes. Um, but also, just as a side note, is that it's also hard, right? It's, it's, it's not, it's, it isn't just, it isn't that easy because there's a lot of other considerations that come into play and come to fore when these things happen. So that's just an aside. Um, on, on the question on, on what we can learn from China, um, you, know, I, you know, I think there's a lot of points that you raised there that are completely valid. I think the one that I would add to it is just, you know, the, the you know, again, we're, we're an infrastructure bank, so I'm going to, talk about infrastructure is just access. I mean, what, what China did in terms of, of creating access uh, to so many different communities that were shut off from opportunity, whether that be in terms of, of education or health or economic opportunity. And so these investments in infrastructure and the heavy focus that China placed on investments in infrastructure and increasing access is, you know, as responsible for as, as anything for the, the, the economic growth that we've seen over the last uh, 30 years. That is, is something that, that is a lesson I think that we can, that we continue to proselytize across the region with varying degrees of success. But you can see that those countries that have, you know, invested higher proportions of their, um, of their GDP in infrastructure have seen greater returns to uh, uh, economic growth, certainly, and ultimately greater returns to poverty reduction. So I think this is just something that we need to continue to work on and something we can draw from the experience of both China and Korea, certainly, to, mm -hmm. to, to a certain extent, and other uh, upper middle income countries in the region. Um, on the gender policy question, all of our projects and programs are assessed uh, for their contribution to, 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 to gender um, and are all, are all are flagged as either um, with, with no gender benefits or elements to, um, you know, to, to, a, a, to a project that's focused solely on, on, on gender um, and, 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 and increasing. We don't have a specific safeguard um, on, on, on gender, um, but I'm sure that our, our, our teams would be willing to have open up a discussion around that. I can't guarantee what the conclusion of that discussion would be, but we're certainly open to, to thoughts and recommendations on that side. If I could pick up on one of the questions, I was quite struck by your telling the powerful story of China. I think it is, um, I was struck by the fact that last year there was a financing for development conference in Addis Ababa. This was the companion to the sustainable development goals. We have these goals, mm -hmm. how are we going to pay for them? And um, country after country, not just from Asia, with a very strong African focus as well, very much focused on the fact that um, official development assistance was absolutely necessary as a catalyst, but immediately turned to domestic resource mobilization as the key. And that certainly is something that we see, mm -hmm. whether in Korea or in China. And then what to me was almost a sea change was rather than being a dirty word, private sector finance was absolutely welcome. And so I do think that that mind shift, mind shift by many developing nations is what gives me optimism, but it also suggests a changing role for the development banks to be less about we're the ones, the only ones who finance this infrastructure, but rather figuring out how they fit into, uh, they're a, a slice of a much larger pie because domestic resources and the private sector in a functioning economy are going to dwarf what official development assistance can provide. Mm -hmm. And um, to the first question, I would just say that the leadership selection at the international financial institutions, everyone is watching this. And so there have been various degrees of openness, which would be an open, transparent, merit-based selection process. And so if you take a look at the selection of the new president of the African Development Bank, in fact, Scott Morris has written about this. Um, and so uh, as being a relatively open process, and we are going to be facing um, the re-election of Jim Kim as the World Bank president. He is going unopposed. 
and he's done a good job, but you're right, isn't it time with the eyes of the world looking to have open merit-based selection processes at these institutions? At the ADB in the class that I teach at SICE, one of the things that I, when I talk about leadership, I would say, and the president of the Asian Development Bank is always Japanese, a male from the Ministry of Finance. And so, you know, that's a kind of a wonky inside joke, but they've done a marvelous job. So if they, I would say the challenge is, if you're in terms of a merit-based selection process, the Japanese Ministry of Finance has some incredibly talented people, men and women, that they could propose as new president of the ADB. But as Steve pointed out, this process, and as I know from being on the inside, these processes are very hard. They take a long time to really come about with the ideal, but don't let the ideal be the enemy of the good and really celebrate those things that are good processes. Um, if we look at the AIIB and the stealing of staff, you know, that's a really interesting model um, of kind of ways that the leadership, not just the top, um, but the heads of departments and, and functional groups could be improved. The second question on China, one of the other things that really struck me, I took a group of students to China. We were looking at China's approach to poverty reduction and sustainable development. And one of the things on environmental conservation and also poverty reduction that really struck me as being quite effective was pairing some of the wealthier cities on the coast with some of the internal more um, where there's a greater prevalence of poverty. And so Chinese citizen to Chinese citizen, a very interesting model that we could learn from. Um, and then the last question on gender, um, when Chantal and I will remember this, that um, there were a number of safeguard, Chantal uh, Wong sitting here, um, and I, uh, one of the things that was back looking historically back in the 90s, there was a gender and development strategy that was one of the safeguards, but then they became like the World Bank group into safeguards policies. And so I would say that my take on that is as long as people are paying attention to gender equity and the impact on uh, women and men um, of projects and lending and operations, um, that is a very important consideration. Thank you for raising it. Chang Young, uh, I don't have anything to add to except saying that uh, the second question, how China succeeded so f successfully so far and whether they will continue to do so, is a question that which makes me very hard to sleep these days. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, we have time for one more round, I think. We'll go here, right here, and then in the back. Uh, Tom Timber Consultant. One of the things that the ADB has done very nicely is working on regional projects and regional infrastructure. And if you will, the time has come for this, both with the new Silk Road and the Asian Highway, which is incredibly for me actually occurring. The pieces are finally uh, setting in. However, I think the Asian, having operationally seen the Asian Development Bank work there, it's marvelous that it's doing it. The, 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 if you will, the, the orientation is there. Often the procedures are highly, highly siloized. So for example, the fact that suddenly if, you, if you're dealing with a non-member state as part of a region, that's a problem. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, the difference between member and non-member states for the Asian Development Bank is often a very important issue. And I wondered if in looking toward the next 50 years, there has been some address uh, both to the opportunity building on it and the problem particularly of the one that I keep coming across, maybe it's no longer the case because I haven't had to deal with that end of the ADB for a decade or two, this question of non-member state, non-member entity, member entity. And again, this, it's okay. not a problem with the World Bank because everybody's a member of the World Bank. So, so the ADB's problem. own barriers to doing a regional project. I should have said at the outset, this is the lightning round of questions so that we can fit in <laughs> okay. some answers. So right here and then quickly in the back. Right here in the front. Hi, Rita Chen from the Central News Agency, Taiwan. My first question is for Stephen. Uh, comparing with the AIIB, what the advantage does the ADB have 
for persuading that your client that they still can rely on you in the future. And Taiwan is also a member of the ADB. From your perspective, how can Taiwan contribute more in the future? And my second question is for Marisa. Um, will U.S. possibly join the AIIB in the future? If not, what are your concerns about the AIIB? Thank you. Okay, last question back here. Ian Tyler, Wall Street Journal. Uh, one, I heard no mention of um, soft power. I wonder if, um, uh, Ms. Lago, you would uh, mind answering this, and perhaps um, uh, you as well. The, uh, what are the mandate, the goals that y you see the ADB as achieving with US taxpayer money, um, given that, uh, that uh, we're supposed to be advancing US interests and leaderships uh, leadership uh, things must have changed in the past 60 years in that regard besides sort of the common uh, goods uh, angle um, and just pure altruism secondly you said that the safeguards Ms. Lago, the safeguards and, and financial governance is uh, very similar to the ADB so what are the hurdles why why isn't the US joining if it's uh, uh, if it's mimicking, it's mimicking the ADB so well and finally uh, is the ADB not uh, facilitating a um, export, China ex financing export machinery uh, for its excess capacity by joining with the AIIB uh, and giving away its competitive edge in co-financing. Uh, Sounds like that wants it directed to you, Steve. Uh, all right. You um, take let me take that? that last bit of the question briefly first, and um, you know, I, I, you know, you. you the, the, that, that question assumes that the the you know the the raison d'etre behind behind the establishment of the AIIB is to export excess capacity um, in China. I, I I I don't subscribe to the notion that that's the the, the purpose of the institution, um, and so therefore I don't think that there's any risk that it, we are exposing ourselves to by working together with AIIB or helping support cr you know again crowding in their that finance effectively, efficiently, um, and taking into account all the relative, relevant safeguards in developing, you know, good infrastructure assets across the region that are going to help with the development of the region and ultimately help with the, with the, the continued economic uh, growth of the world. I mean, Asia is a, gr a growth engine for the world, so any investment we're making that's going to help sustain that growth is beneficial to the United States, it's beneficial to the world. So that, I think, is important that, that we're doing that, and I, I, I think that that's a, why we should continue to do it. The second question on, on ADB's advantages over AIIB, I, I wouldn't think of it as advantages necessarily, it's just differences between our institutions. We're 50 years old, so we have relationships with all of these countries. We have you know, long-standing approaches and procedures and expertise and, 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 uh, and influence. We have the the, the convening power, uh, we have the, you know, peop, the, these countries know us, we are a, a trusted partner. These are all things that AIIB will develop over time, um, but these are, you know, differences between our institutions at the moment. Um, and, and again, I, I wouldn't think of them so much as advantages, it's just differences uh, between our institutions. Um, and the, the second part of your question about what we can do with, with Taiwan, we, Taiwan is a member of, of ADB and we continue to work um, with, with the government of Taiwan and, and, and appreciate the support that the government of Taiwan has provided uh, both to our, you know, in, in its subscribed capital and also its generous contributions to our concessional windows which have continued over time. Um, lastly, uh, very briefly, um, you know, the point on regional projects and, and, and regional uh, development and regional infrastructure, I'm glad you brought that up because it is one uh, feature of ADB that is different from all the other uh, banks. Uh, we're the only um, MDB that has regional cooperation in our charter. Um, so it is a special responsibility we bear um, and something that we do focus on and either whether that be through various sub-regional economic uh, cooperation programs that we support or working with ASEAN or, or any other um, kind of body, it is something we do prioritize. The challenge that you articulate with respect to members and non-members is, is something that we're addressing. We have now the ability to 
do waivers much more quickly than we had in the past, and we're much more willing to do those types of waivers. There is discussion and time over you know, whether we you know, can actually do away with the need for those kinds of waivers and just make that a standard um, approach and operating procedure. That will take some time, but it is certainly uh, forefront in our, in our thinking at, at the moment. Marisa. Given that it's the lightning round, I'll give lightning answers. Um, <laughs> with respect to the AIIB, the United States is not, at this point, considering joining the AIIB. We are very focused on meeting our commitments and seeing the major MDBs of which we're a member strengthened. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to the question of why um, is the U.S. investing taxpayer dollars, why has the U.S. across different political administrations invested taxpayer dollars in these multilateral institutions, I think it's a three-part answer. The first is U.S. national security. One need only look at the work of the ADB and the World Bank in Afghanistan. Um, the U.S. Navy is one of the biggest supporters of us operating or contributing to the multilateral development banks because they see climate change as affecting the extent of the waterways that will then be within their purview. Um, the second is we are creating the export markets of the future for U.S. businesses, which leads to U.S. jobs. So there is an element there of seeing the global public good, but also a good for U.S. workers, U.S. businesses. And then finally, you reference the fact that there is this sense of doing the right thing. The way it was best exp um, expressed to me by a very wise staffer up on the Hill is when people are hungry, they fight. When people fight, the U.S. military is frequently involved. And so contributing to the stability of the world by relatively small dollar investments in fragile states, in eradicating the extreme poverty that results, as, as Steve had noted, can result in refugee and migrant crisis, is again another reason why we believe that this is a very good investment of U.S. dollars. Okay. Any remaining uh, answers to the outstanding questions? I think that covers it. Good. Okay, so before I ask you to thank the panel, let me just note that uh, the ADB actually is, is uh, hosting a reception uh, just outside the door in celebration of the anniversary, so uh, you are welcome to join us there. Uh, but please do thank me, or join me in thanking <laughs> the panel. Thank you. Thank you.